That is so true, so true. That's a wonderful truth in a song. I, I tell you, yeah, the, the last two songs we did today, they were kind of oldies but goodies, right? You know, I, that's what, <laughs> when somebody like me says, let's sing an oldie. I mean, I'm talking about probably like a hymn, you know, <laughs> Amazing Grace or, or Power in the Blood or something like that. When our young people talk about something old, they're talking about something about like last year sometime or something. It is a matter of perspective, by the way, what is considered old in life. But uh, anyway, thank you guys. So, so good, man. I, I finally have gotten my voice back um, where I can actually sing that stuff. So thank you so much. Not quite as well as they do, but at least it's, at least I have a chance on it, you know? My goodness. Well, last week, <clears throat> we finished up, or I finished up, the series on Change Your Life. Now, I know that I went through a lot of things very quickly uh, because I shared with you five messages that had 10 laws in each message. And those laws were concerning the major areas of our life. Well, last week, uh, the finishing message was about family support and about God putting us together as husbands and wives and families, or even uh, if you're single, with friends and people that, uh, that are your comrades and, 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 your, and your partners and your pals. And, and he does things through us together that, uh, that are very dynamic and can't be done by ourselves is what it really boils down to because uh, we need each other. And don't ever forget that. There are no lone rangers in the Christian life. God does not intend for us to be in this thing alone. As a matter of fact, the book of Romans says a lot of things about how we all belong to each other and how uh, we all supply what each other needs and no one has all of the gifts. So we have to work together so that all of the needs get met. Well, anyway, the last point was about self-control. And it was dealing with how to be in self-control with each other and don't violate each other and violate God's law and, 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 and control things and temptation and so forth. Um, at the end of the message, uh, and I know you guys out there don't know Rick and uh, everybody here does, but uh, <laughs> Rick often comes and talks to me after messages and it's very encouraging. He's, he's just a wonderful person and Anyway, he usually has questions that are unanswerable most of the time, but, uh, but we, love, we love to hear them. If you think, if you think well, you haven't even heard any, I don't think, but if you come to, uh, if you come to the, the, to the uh, refresh time on Wednesday, the uh, recharge, yeah, recharge. I was, I was losing the word, <laughs> recharge, I'm old. Recharge on Wednesday, you'll hear all kinds of questions like that. I mean, just bunches of them. And anyway, so we have fun with all that stuff. And he, but at the end, he said, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to preach or anything about that, but he said, maybe, do you think maybe you could give us a little bit more about this self-control at some, sometime, you know? And uh, he said, you know, I'm just interested in that. And, and uh, so I went home and... I, you need, I wasn't going to tell on you, brother. I was going to... I was trying to make it light. I was trying to make it light. He said, I need that. That's what he, what he said. And I went home, and, and, I, and uh, of course, I know you believe me. I wouldn't be lying, especially up here. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, yeah, Tanya, you can ask Tanya. Uh, uh, this whole week, I, worked, I tried to work on other stuff. I did work on other stuff. I worked on all week long. I worked on uh, some message that I'm going to start next week. And, uh, but I was going to do it to start today. And uh, about, Thursday, <laughs> about Thursday afternoon, which I don't know if you guys know this, but that's kind of late um, because, of, because of notes and uh, PowerPoints and all kind of things like that. Uh, that's kind of a late time to start uh, from scratch on something, you know. And I just, but I said, well, let me just look at this. And I did, and man, I just got all involved in it. And I told Tanya, I said, I, I, I knew this was gonna happen to me one day, and here it is. And that is that now I, I'm, I'm too, I don't, I don't have enough time to go back and, and work on what I was doing, and I don't have enough time to finish what I am doing. So I am in a straight between two, <laughs> a rock and a hard place. But the Lord helped me, and, um, and this message today is about self-control, um, and, and hopefully it'll be helpful uh, to you, 
because uh, this is something that all of our lives are, the Bible has a great deal to say about self-control. It only, it, the, the, the word, the old King James word is the word temperance. If you are a temperate person, you are under control. Uh, and, and we used to use words like that. And uh, there was a whole movement at one time back in the early 1920s, the temperance movement, where they eliminated alcohol from the country. But the word temperate is the old King James word. And though that word only appears seven times in six verses, uh, the Bible does have a great deal to say about self-control and about being under control. And the first thing we need to realize, and this, it'll be this first scripture that comes on the screen, and this is from Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23 that you know very well. It is the fruit of the spirit. So self-control is actually one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that gets birthed into our life as the Holy Spirit inhabits our life, and then it begins to grow and mature. But let's read it, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So self-control is, uh, is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, the, the word is enkratia, which probably doesn't mean anything to you and doesn't matter about it. But what it means is uh, literally in power or in strength. So what self-control means as far as a vocabulary word and the way the scripture uses it, it, it means strength or power from within. So the only question becomes then, uh, whose power, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, the fruit of self-control, as the term implies, enables the Holy Spirit to come into our life and control the passions and the desires that, that we have that now are being challenged by this new nature, this new Christian nature that we have. Because you guys are well aware that before you get saved, uh, you have a spirit. Uh, the scripture says that we are a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. But before we come to Christ, our spirit is not made alive. Oh, it, it's, it's there. Uh, it can be activated by the power of God at any time, but, it, but it's not on the throne of our life. This is 1 Corinthians 3, if you want to read all about it. It's what it talks about. And uh, for two and three, it talks about the carnal man and the, and the spiritual man and so forth, and the natural man. So you know this, that uh, our soul is in charge of things, what we think, what we feel, what we want, our passions, our desires. But when Christ comes into our life, the Holy Spirit inhabits us. And when he does, he brings with him these fruit that are mentioned in Galatians chapter five, whereby he now, rather than allowing our passions to control our spirit, our spirit now begins to control our soul so that, that uh, control is loosed in our life so that, and this is what Jesus said, this is what it means when Jesus said this in Luke 9, 23, very famous passage of scripture. Uh, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit begins to control our life. As we each day take up our cross, because we all have crosses every day that we have to bear, challenges, uh, decisions, uh, intrusions, uh, complications, uh, issues in our life. And as we every day deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, our life grows and the fruit of God's spirit grows in our life. Now, it has to come from God because, well, the apostle Paul tells us, let, let's read it, Romans chapter eight. In Romans chapter eight, verse five, here's what Paul says. This is, why, this is why the Holy Spirit has to bring it to us, all right? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. 
but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally, everybody say fleshly, that's what it means. To be fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the fleshly mind, the carnal mind is enmity, which means hostile against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So the reason the Holy Spirit has to bring this fruit into our life that allows control of our life so that our passions and our desires no longer rule us, but we actually rule over them in the Holy Spirit is because uh, the mindset of the flesh is hostile to the things of God and, it, and it, because it doesn't submit itself to the law of God and the reason it doesn't submit itself to the law of God is because not only that it doesn't want to, but it, it is unable to do so. It, it can't uh, give itself over to the things of God. So the natural human mind is not capable of being in complete subjection to the law of God. Therefore, we need power within. We need in kratia. We need a power that comes from within. Jesus said it this way. He said, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, our attitude is willing, but our human willpower can't perform what our attitude is. And as an example, I'm sure, or I feel sure that all of the disciples of Jesus, maybe Judas excluded, obviously, but all the disciples of Jesus felt like that they would hang with Jesus to the very end, that they would not, never forsake Jesus, but when the going got really, really scary, the scripture says that they all le left him and ran away. So the word self-control can be a little misleading <laughs> because effective self-control is not self-controlling self because it can't control itself. To, to totally have self-control, it means we need, a, we need a power over our life that has the power to bring our desires and our pa desires and passions into control. And that's what the scripture calls power from on high. This is what Luke said to us in Acts, and then he also said it in Luke 24, added a little bit to it. He said, here's what Jesus told us when he, after he resurrected and before he went back to heaven. Here's what he said. He said, now guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to go to the upper room and I want you to pray and stay there and pray until you be endued with power from on high. And so this is what it takes for self-control to become part of our life. And the question was, whose power do we need to be filled with? Well, of course, the power that comes from God as the Holy Spirit matures this fruit in our life. And let me just say this about self-control, and I know it's obvious to, to you if you've dealt with it, which we do every day, obviously. Uh, this is a long-term process. Uh, this, <clears throat> this is not a, a, a magic show where you can be prayed for and have it immediately. You know, it's like, come to the altar and let's pray for self-control. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we do because we want self-control, but it, it matures in our life. And like any of the other fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control, the more I grow in the Lord and the closer I am to Jesus, the more of the fruit is exhibited in my life. And so really, it's, a, it's an internal power. So, all right, Pastor, do you have any tips for us about how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that he can work self-control in our life as quickly as possible. What can we do? I mean, what can we do? Because that's the real question, really. Uh, I don't think any of you need to be persuaded that you need self-control, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, just travel down the road with you a few minutes. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure we can see a, oh my Lord, we need some self-control. Um, 
So it's not a question of whether we need it. You know we need it. All right, what can we do that's gonna, what, what, what can we do that will be a cooperation with God so that this can be worked into my life uh, as quickly as possible and as deeply as possible? So I'm gonna come mature in this. All right, now I do have some tips and some suggestions and I'm gonna just call them steps for lack of a better way to describe them. All right, so seven steps then we're gonna have in cooperation with the Holy Spirit to create self-control or to move self-control in our life. All right, here's the first one. Number one, first step, admit your problem. <laughs> That's profound, isn't it, right? Yeah, anytime, really, anytime that there's anything in your life that you need to, to grow past, um, this is always the first step no matter what you're talking about, because the first thing is that we've got to realize uh, where we are and who's responsible for this. So according to what James says in James chapter one, now put on your steel-toed shoes because James never pulls any punches. Listen to what James says the problem is. Verse 14, James one, but each one Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Uh, enticed means lured, uh, uh, like a fisherman, you know, throws a lure. Any of you guys fish? Y'all like to fish? I'm, I'm not a big fisherman, but uh, I know what a lure does. And a lure is something to entice the fish to bite. Or uh, I learned on one of those fishing programs, uh, a lot of times a lure is intended to just aggravate the fish so it attacks. You know, I never thought about that, but that was what they said. And anyway, so the, the, uh, uh, James says uh, the, the, problem, <laughs> the problem is us because we have all kinds of desires and we can be lured by the enemy to participate in any of these desires. So I'm telling you, the first step is you have to admit the problem because we are expert rationalizers. I mean, look, uh, I have a problem. What, what problem? Uh, you know, uh, well, this is just the way I am. This, this is just the way I was brought up, you know. Uh, everybody else is doing it, or my favorite. The devil made me do it. I mean, we are experts at rationalizing the issue, the issue away, but James says our problem is that we like the path of least resistance, and the path of least resistance is usually the easiest path. Exactly. And so the reason we sin is because we like it. And that's our problem. If it weren't for the consequences of sin, sin would be great. I mean, really, wouldn't it? I mean, if we, but the consequences are, uh, ooh, they can be devastating. So admit the problem. Second step, put your past behind you. This is another way of saying you cannot adopt the slogan, once a failure, always a failure. Because if you do, you're gonna quit before you even uh, get started. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta leave some stuff back there. Let, let me just show you what Paul says, and this is very familiar scripture, Philippians 3. You all know it. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Paul is saying, I don't, I'm not telling you that I've laid hold of everything. That's what he's saying. He said, I, I don't have everything firmly in grasp in my life. I'm not trying to brag and tell you I've got it all under control. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, this, these verses expose a misconception that will keep you from getting self-control, and that is what I mentioned, once a failure, all, always a failure. Uh, I, I, gotta let, I gotta let that go. I mean, if I've tried 10 times and I've been unsuccessful, I can't dwell on my 10 times that I've not been successful. I, 
I, I, I press past that. I mean, past failure doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to change. It just means, but it does guarantee if you keep, if you keep focusing on it that it's gonna repeat itself. I mean, it does do that. So I gotta let my past go. It, it, to not let my past go is, trying to, is like trying to drive an automobile looking in a rear view mirror. I mean, if you try to drive an automobile looking in the rear view mirror, I can guarantee you that you are going to collide with things that are in front of you. So you gotta let that go and you have to accept the fact that, okay, maybe I failed, but Christ is gonna give me the strength and I'm gonna go through. You, you have to look at it with, with that kind of attitude. Uh, number three, here's step number three. Step number three, talk back to your feelings. You're gonna have to talk back to your feelings because they're gonna be screaming at you. Look at Titus 2. When's the last time you read anything from the book of Titus? How many of them knew Titus was even in the Bible? There's a book. Yeah, I, there used to be a TV show called Titus, didn't it, right? Far from anything in the Bible though, believe me. Titus 2, here it is. For the grace of God, Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. Everybody say under control. That's what that means. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So because the grace of God has been delivered to us, we have the ability to deny ungodliness in our life and worldly lust, and we'll have the ability to live under control righteously and godly in this life. So God doesn't want us to be controlled by our moods and our feelings. Much of the loss of control in our life has to do with our moods and our feelings. I don't feel like studying. I don't, I, I, I don't feel like working. I don't feel like going to work. I don't feel like getting out of bed. Uh, I don't feel like paying attention to that. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like going to church. What I do feel like is some more fried chicken and some mashed potatoes. <laughs> yeah, our feelings and our, and our emotions. So Titus says we have to fight the tendency to believe that everything has to feel good or it's not worthwhile in life. So we have to talk back to our feelings that are gonna lead us astray on every hand. All right, number four, step number four. Can you believe that I'm moving this fast? I can't believe this. Man, all right, turn over a new leaf. Number four, step number four. All right, believe that you can change. You'd be surprised how many people fail because they just don't think it's possible for them to change. Um, especially in something that's been there forever, a long time. Let me, let me read you Romans 12. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Of course, Another very familiar, <laughs> all these are familiar passages. They're not anything hidden. Uh, beginning at verse one of Romans 12, first couple of verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Here's where it comes in. And do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, there are not many ironclad conclusions that we can come to concerning belief. But I think one we can come to is this one. Your belief controls your behavior. You behave the way you do because you believe what you believe. And what you believe directly controls how you act in life, what you participate in, how you respond to things. 
uh, what you believe about things. That's, I mean, th- this, this is controlled by, by our mind. It's a, it's a terrible thing to waste. It's a powerful tool that God gives us. So when self-control is being tested, we have to do something with our mind. So what would we do? Well, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2, when our self-control is being tested, we have to fill our mind with something that can transform it. So what would that be? Well, I'm just going to make a suggestion that what about the promises of God? I mean, there are bunches of them. I mean, just hundreds of promises in the Word, very powerful promises. I, I, I put a few, uh, we'll look at it on the screen, and they're from the New Living Translation. They're, they're all familiar to you, but I thought you might like to look at another little version of it. But, but like 1 Corinthians 10, 13, here's one of them. But remember that temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and he'll keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. This is a promise from God that whatever problem's going on that's tempting your self-control, it's not anything different than everybody else deals with. You're not experiencing some strange thing. It's a common thing. And God knows your level of temptation. Now, this is where a lot of people miss this verse and and what it says. This verse is is saying, God knows your level of temptation. And when, when, when your temptation begins to get to the peak of your level of temptation, God is gonna make a way out. It doesn't mean you're not gonna go past that. It means you get he's gonna give you a way out before it gets too too much for you. So you have to pay attention to God's way out. (laughs) I've used the illustration before that uh, suppose you have a a, a male boss and a a female secretary and there's an attraction there and it's been building and building and it's been flirty and flirty and it's been more and more. And on this particular day, it just is like one of those days where it's just uh, almost overwhelming. And, and into the office comes the secretary and she's very attractive and smells good and everything. And you're sitting there going, mm, uh, man, uh, this is just overwhelming to me. And all of a sudden the phone rings. Guess who's on the phone? It's your wife. That's your way out. That's what we're talking about. But you gotta take the way out. Don't just slam, <laughs> slam the phone down and say, I'm busy. You, know? <laughs> you gotta take the way out. <laughs> But that's a promise of God. Now, now that would help you. All right, here's another one, Philippians 4.13. This, this is what you had on the inside of your baseball hat when Justin was pitching in, in Little League Baseball and he had a Philippians 4.13 written on the inside of the brim of his hat and I'd notice him out there just about between every pitch he'd be standing there on the rubber and he'd look up and you'd see him looking up at the brim of his cap. And, and here's what he would be reading, for I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me strength I need. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is the older way. That, that's, that's a promise from God. Or Mark 9, 23. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything's possible if a person believes. I mean, that's a good way of saying that. So stop setting yourself up for failure by constantly criticizing yourself and not believing that God has the power and he'll give it to you and help you and work with you in order to change these things in life. Step number, what is it, five? Yeah, step number five. Oh, this is a big one. You must do this, totally. Make yourself accountable. Look, you're gonna have to be accountable to something, someone, it's gonna be very difficult to, 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 to come under control if there's no, um, if there's, well, you need somebody with skin on. You know, it's like the little girl that was just crying because it was a terrible storm outside and she was just wailing and her dad runs into the room and, and she, she, he says, what's the matter, honey? She said, I'm scared of the storm and it's so loud and it's frightening. And he said, well, baby, don't you know that God will take care of you? And she said, yeah, but daddy, sometimes I need somebody with skin on, you know 
to hug me. Well, you need somebody with skin on uh, to, 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 to be accountable to. Let, let me just read you a couple of passages. Ecclesiastes 4.12, we read it in, in our 10 laws. Uh, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And, and, and that's common sense. Uh, well, may not be so common, but that's, <laughs> that's sense. Now, Galatians 6, 2, here's another one. Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So this is telling us that part of our ministry as Christians is to support each other and to bear one another's burdens and to watch out for each other and to encourage each other and to pick each other up. So I've got about four suggestions for you. Uh, they're in your note, the notes that, that I hand out to you if you want them, but they'll come up here on the screen. Let me show them. Number one, find a partner of the same sex. I always say this because... People, I don't know, people, it would be very rare. I'm not gonna say it's impossible because I know some, some relationships and I don't know how they work, but I've known them long enough to know it does. When you have different sexes, it, it's very hard for that not to turn into something of an attraction. Not, not that you might be the one, that somebody might be attracted to you and then you're gonna have to rebuff that and then it's gonna get complicated and then, you know, boom, there it goes. Uh, or it may be something that develops because, I mean, sharing each other's uh, burdens uh, it, it pulls your emotions together. It, it, it pulls you together and sooner or later, um, it usually causes problems. Like I said, I do know a few people, so it's not purely dogmatic, but if I were you and, and, and I was looking for an accountability partner, it would be somebody of the same sex for me. Number two, seek a partner that is faithful to the commitment. All right, don't get somebody that doesn't care about what's happening with you or that doesn't have time or doesn't want to, you know? I mean, if they don't show any interest in you at all, if they don't even listen to you when you talk about something, they're not going to pay attention to what's happening in your life. So they don't wanna be involved. They don't wanna be bothered with it or maybe they're too busy or they've got a big family or whatever it might be. But find someone that is faithful to the commitment that they're gonna make because it is gonna be a commitment, believe me. Number three, find someone who's familiar with the types of issues that you face. If your issue is alcohol, and I'm just saying that because it's the easiest thing to, for all of us to know about. If your issue is alcohol, don't find somebody that does, that's never drank any alcohol or that doesn't know anything about symptoms of, of, of addiction and stuff like that. I mean, you, you, have, you need somebody who's, who's wise enough and experienced enough to see what's happening with you even though you're gonna lie about it. Yeah, how, how, you, how you do it? Fine, I'm fine. Really? Well, you don't look fine. Uh, what's going on with that? You know? And then they say, well, you know, I, yeah, I did that same thing, man. I'm gonna tell you, you gotta, you gotta quit that now. That ain't gonna work. That, you, you're killing yourself. I, I mean, you, know, you just gotta have somebody that can hold you responsible and will know that you're lying when you're lying or deceiving or covering up or whatever it is, and and will care enough to, to challenge you with it. That's accountability. Uh, number four, select someone who can be confidential. <laughs> yeah, don't get somebody that's so needy. I mean, that they want everybody to think that they're valuable and they're worthy. And, and if they know something that you don't know, uh, if, you, if you pump them just a little bit, they'll tell you all about Man, what something they know that you don't know because that makes them feel valuable. I mean, don't get somebody like that. The, the town gossip, no. I mean, stay away from people like that because you don't want people telling you business. So make yourself accountable. That's the fifth step. Sixth step. Oh, yeah. You could just head it all off at the pass with this one if you wanted to. Avoid temptation. Isn't that easy? 
avoid temptation. Uh, I have been in the ministry all these years, and I have at times in, in the, over these years, I have been with people and in churches, uh, and nothing's wrong with this, it's just an observation, where they had a big ministry called deliverance. Now, I mean, God does deliver us from things, and it's right to pray for God to deliver from all kinds of bondages and issues and so forth. And there are some things that are uh, very difficult uh, without some type of uh, prayer, like Jesus says, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. So I'm not making fun of deliverance ministry by any means, but I'm just saying that in my experience with it, most of the things that people wanted to be delivered from they could have gotten deliverance from if they would just avoid the temptation, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you're an alcoholic, don't walk in a bar. Hey, you know? I mean, if you're a lust hound, uh, you know, don't go down to Hooters or, you know, I, I mean, obviously stay away. I mean, avoid the temptation. That's the simplest, easiest thing. Stay out of the path of trouble that is coming at you. Look at, here's Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Diablos, you remember? Diablos is the accuser and the slanderer. So you go to bed mad at night, and he crawls up on your pillow and whispers in your ear all kind of accusations and slanders against the one that you're at wrath with, and by the morning, you are not only not better, you're way worse because he's talked to you all night long. In other words, you've given him a place. That's, so what I'm talking about with the, with the temptation deal is, look, don't give him a place. Don't give him a pulpit to preach to you from and entice you and, and lure you away and, 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 and avoid things that tempt you and stay away from situations that weaken your self-control. It's like the old great American theologian Forrest Gump said, if you don't want to get stung, stay away from bees. All right, move on. Amen. Number seven. This is the last step, by the way. Mm, depend on Christ's power. Yeah, I saw all of you look at the clock. I said, this is the last step, and everybody went, what? I didn't say I was finished with the last step. It's just the last step. Here it is, depend on Christ's power. Yeah, Galatians 5, 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice the sequence. Let the Spirit direct your life, then you'll not satisfy the desires of your human nature. Simple, right? It not, not, uh, notice it doesn't say that you're not going to have the temptations, right? <laughs> it doesn't say they're going away and that you won't have them. It just says you're not going to fulfill them if you walk in the Spirit. Well, we usually get this sequence backwards is what we do. I mean, think about it. Um, I've had so many people, um, goodness, man, just through the years. Um, I try to encourage them to come to the Lord. Or, or, or at least come to church and, and, and give, the, give the Holy Spirit a, a platform to, to, to work in your life, you know. And, and here's what they would say, something like this. Well, you know, Pastor, when I get my life cleaned up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to church. Yeah, I mean, look, I, look, if I went to church, the roof would fall in because I, I, need, to get, I need to get some of the stuff out of my life and then, and then, then I'm gonna come to church. Or when I, get, when I get hold of my problem, then I'm going to walk with the Lord. Now, that, that's just exactly backward. God says, no, 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 no. Come to me while you're still struggling, and I'm going to help you change. I mean, what would you think of me if I said, uh, I'm going to get well first, and then I'm going to go to the doctor? I mean, you'd say, Pastor, you're about a French fry or two short of a Happy Meal. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you ain't on all eight, right? Well, we say all kind of ridiculous things 
When I quit doing this, then I'm going to come to church. When I get this cleaned up, I'm going to do, do right. No, God says, depend on me because I have the power to help you with your struggles. And you're not going to conquer them by yourself. You're going to have to trust my power. All right, now, let me give you an, a little, I think, an interesting little observation here, and then, and then we'll quit, all right? And this is just about the whole passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Galatians, that's the one we started with, and it is, um, for, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Did I put that back? Yeah, there it is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, against such there is no law. And um, the observation is um, all of those fruit or all of that fruit, and notice uh, uh, grammatically, because of the way the sentence states it, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Nine things. It doesn't say the fruits are. It says the fruit is, as if it all comes in one package. It's not nine different fruits. It's one fruit with nine flavors. And all of them get delivered at the same time. And so you can't have love and not have joy, or joy and not have peace and be at peace, but not be long-suffering. I mean, they all come together at one time. But I think that it's fitting that self-control comes at the end of the list because I think it is probably the last one of these to be fully developed in our life. The list is bracketed by love and self-control. You see, love's at the first and self-control's at the end and all the others are in between. It, it is, is there a reason for that? Well, I'm not sure that it, there is a reason, but I'll tell you what it says to me. It says that love is first on the list because it's the greatest power of all. 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest, the chapter, greatest love chapter in the Bible says, love never fails. It says, now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love because love is the only one that's going to endure into eternity. Faith will no longer be needed. Hope certainly won't be needed. Love is still going to be there because it's the greatest and most powerful of all. And so love becomes the base from which all these others grow. Without love, none of those others can grow in our life. And self-control is the closing bracket that makes all of them work. Without self-control, none of those other fruit work in our life. You can't have joy without self-control or peace without self-control. You can't be long-suffering if you can't control yourself, gentle if you can't control yourself, meek. No, it all takes self-control. And as a matter of fact, the verses right before this starting in verse 17 and coming through verse 21. Yeah, I'm on, that's 19 right there. These are the contrast to the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the apostle Paul is saying, these are the works of the flesh, and then in verse 21, but the fruit of the Spirit is. And then he, con he contrasts the works of the flesh and the work of the Spirit. Notice that of all of these works of the flesh, one single fruit can conquer every one of those. One single fruit can defeat every one of those. It's a super fruit, you know. <laughs> it's self-control. Self-control conquers adultery. It conquers fornication. 
It conquers uncleanness, certainly lewdness, can't, can't stand up to self-control. Idolatry, sort of, any of those, drunkenness, revelings, all, all of that is conquered by one single superfruit, self-control. And it all begins by inviting Christ into your life so that the Holy Spirit can be loosed in you to bring the fruit of God's Spirit into our life. So let's, let's bow for just a second.